Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all of His noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam As we greet you with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Here in South Hall in London for the second time our topic tonight is not an easy one it's a difficult one uh, but I just had some delicious Hyderabadi biryani so it should help me with the lecture <laughs> the lecture is Ghazwatul Hind and Akhirul Zaman and uh, you should not attempt to comment on this subject unless you have first studied the subject. So turn to those who have the competence to be able to explain and analyze the subject. It is not an easy one, but more than that, it's a dangerous subject. And I want to begin with one verse of the Quran, but there are several verses of the Quran. We do not go, we're not going to take all the verses of the Quran tonight. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran in Surah Al Ma'idah and he makes a divine prophecy. There are some ayat of the Quran which are ayat muhkamat they are plain and clear no two ways about it and there are other ayat which are ayat mutashabihat and they have to be subjected to something called ta'wil interpretation but no matter who you are if you interpret the Quran, only Allah can confirm that your interpretation is correct. So you cannot interpret the Quran and use that to divide the Ummah. You cannot interpret the Quran and use that to build a sect. No. When you interpret the Quran, you must be humble enough to say, Allahu Alam. Allah knows best. But you should never interpret the Quran unless and until you are convinced in your heart that what you are offering as an interpretation is credible. This is not an ayah mutashabiha. This now is an ayah muhkamah. بعد أوز بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لا تجدنا you will most certainly find أشد الناس عداوة للذين آمنوا those who will be most hostile as enemies to you now when the Quran is being revealed and in time to come fell Mudariya. Al Yahud, the first that the Quran mentions are the Jews. The term Yahud was never used prior to that effort to crucify the Messiah. At that time they were still still Banu Israel <coughs> and Nabi Isa alayhi was salam, as salam was sent to Banu Israel but after that event when some of them wept when they saw what they saw and others celebrated and if this was not in the Quran they'd send me to jail as they sent Ali and Soral to jail for anti-Semitism but it's there in the Quran so you can't send me to jail for what is in the Quran they celebrated when they saw 
what they recognized as a crucifixion. At that time, the names changed. They are no longer referred to as Banu Israel. Now, these who celebrated are called the Jews, al Yahud, and those who wept are now called al Nasara, the Christians. And these two combined are known as Ahlul Kitab. So this is the ex, ex, uh, explanation of the term Yahud in this ayah that you will most certainly find now when the Quran is being revealed and in time to come that those who will display the greatest hatred and enmity and hostility to you the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam would be the Jews. It was true at the time when the Quran was revealed and at this time it is again true. But then the Quran goes on to say وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا Not only would the Jews display this hatred for you but in addition to the Jews, the people of shirk. And the Quran does not lump them all together. The people of shirk. The Quran does not lump them all together. It identifies a people of shirk who will behave the way the Jews are behaving. And who will display the greatest hatred for you. Today, the heart of shirk in the world is in Monkey Town. You never heard that before, eh? Monkey Town. Yes? When they were allowed to conquer the city without fighting. Which city? <laughs> Oh yes, you've got to go back to the Quran and do your homework. It's Surah Al-A'raf. وَاسْأَلْهُمْ عَنِ الْقَرْيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ حَاضِرَةَ الْبَحْرِ The city by the sea. And in the Hadith, it is shaped as a triangle. It has three sides. And the city falls to them with لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ No fighting. So Allah ordained that they should get the city. And then <laughs> they are uh, Banu Israel, they are Christians, not Jews, because the Jews are now scattered. They are not allowed to come into one city, not the Jews. So they are Christians. And they have to observe the Sabbath, which is. Yawmusab, or what they call Saturday, and you're not allowed to work, so you're not allowed to fish. And then Allah tested them, He sent the fish, big like this, and they're jumping, you can see them jumping, uh, on the day of the Sabbath. And then every other day of the week, no fish. So they're being tested. And some of them said to themselves, we don't care two peanuts for the law. No. And they went fishing. <laughs> and they're still fishing to this day. To this day. And another group said, Listen, Allah will punish you. Beware. You violate the law. And a third group who had spiritual insight, Basira. They said, why bother to warn these people? They have gone past the point of no return. There's no turning back for them. They have abandoned the deed. And those who went fishing Allah punished them. And he said, Kunu kiradatan khasi'in. Be apes, despise. But a human being, insofar as the Quranic guidance is concerned, I'm not talking about Hollywood or Disneyland. I'm talking about the Quran. A human being cannot be transformed into an ape. A human being remains a human being until judgment day. Nor is there something despicable 
in the way monkeys live. They, are, they don't put on clothes, they're naked, and their bedroom life is in the public, but that's sutra. So what does it mean? Be apes despise. It means that people who ought to live like human beings are now punished by Allah to live like apes with a preference for public nudity and nude beaches and appearing in, the, in public naked and almost naked and also bringing their bedroom life into the public. That is the modern Western world. And the modern Western world is exporting this garbage to the rest of the world. And it is this modern Western civilization which is firmly founded on the foundations of indisputable shirk. And it is this modern West which is showing the greatest hatred for Islam. But this is my opinion. And you must not accept my opinion, warning you, unless you're convinced that I'm correct. So no one can blame me for brainwashing people. I respect your independent thinking. I invite you to think. I'm here in England to do only one thing. Not <laughs> to take over anybody's masjid. <laughs> no. I am here to invite you to think. So the people who will be most hostile to you, waging war on Islam, are these two people. And then the Quran goes on to say that at that time when these two people are waging war on you, showing hostility to you, hatred and enmity, لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارًا There are some who are not too happy with Allah, you know. They wish that this verse could be written. They have more knowledge of the deen than Allah himself. But this is what Allah has said. And you will most certainly find at that time when the Quran was being revealed, remember Abyssinia, remember the niggas of Abyssinia? And in time to come, when the Jews display that same hatred again, at that time you will find a Christian people. No, it doesn't say that. It says that you will find a people who will be closest in love and affection for you. And yesterday, in Birmingham, I had a session of an, an hour and a half with four Orthodox Christian monks. An hour and a half of intense discussions. And I had to be repeating this verse to them again and again and again and again. And the hour and a half passed in a very friendly way. No tension. No hostility, no rivalry, nobody seeking to defeat the other in any argument. Ahmad Didad style. No, this was different. And you will most certainly find that those who will be closest in love and affection for you at that time when these show that hatred for you would be a people who say in uh, Nasara, they proclaim that they are Christians, so they're not a secularized people. Their primary identity is their faith. This couldn't be monkey town. <laughs> monkey town is secularized. They are Christians on Sunday morning and for the rest of the week, they forget about their religion. And then the Quran goes on to identify these people, these Christians that they will be a people who have the institution of the priesthood, they will preserve the monastic way of life, and they will not be an arrogant people. 
They don't want Venezuela to bend its knee before them in submission. They don't want Russia to bend its knee before them in submission. They don't want China to bend its knee before them in submission. And if you don't bend your knee, we'll wage nuclear war on you. They're not like that. They don't have this arrogance. وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ They're not a people who want to rule the world. These Christians. And tonight is we, I took so much time to introduce this ayah. Tonight, as we turn to the alleged hadith on Ghazwatul Hin, that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam is alleged to have prophesied. Two hadiths, both in uh, Nisai, and one says that you will conquer Hin. And the other one says that at the time when you conquer him, it will be at the time when Nabi Isa would have come. And uh, they come from only one companion, Abu Hurairah, radiallahu ta'ala. And uh, tonight as we address the subject of Ghazwatul Hind, which has caught fire, and the fire is scorching the whole of Pakistan, and much of India, and so on. Uh, and it is leading in a very dangerous direction. Those who are beating the drums of Ghazwatul Hind, they don't know the danger. It is necessary for us to examine the, uh, the hadith. And it cannot be done by schoolboys who take US dollars and state-of-the-art weapons from Santa Claus to go and wage their bogus jihad here and there and everywhere. And they got only peanuts in their heads. Those are not the ones to study these alleged hadiths and determine what is their status. No. That is to be done by those who have knowledge. And they don't have knowledge when they jump on the wagon of Santa Claus to wage their jihad. Who is Hind? The word Hindu comes from Hind. So the Hindu is someone who belongs to Hind. The Hindu is someone who belongs to a territory known as Hind. So when the, when the, the Hadith allegedly says you're going to conquer Hind, it is talking about a territory. It doesn't talk about a religion. It talks about a territory, Hind. And Hind at that time comprised what the, the whole of the territory of Pakistan. Today, if I'm wrong, could you kindly stand up and tell me I'm wrong? If I'm wrong, could you kindly stand up and tell me I'm wrong? <coughs> that Hind at the time of Nabi Muhammad Wasallam comprised the whole of the territory of Pakistan today. The whole of the territory of India today, the whole of the territory of Bangladesh today, and maybe part of Afghanistan as well. That's a tall order, eh? that you're going to conquer Pakistan, and you're going to conquer India, and you're going to conquer Bangladesh. So this is certainly not a prophecy that has any connection with the Republic of India. That's the first mistake they make. The Hadith speaks of Hind. But in Hind are the Hindu people. And the Hindu people today are recognized as a people belonging to a particular religion. So the appearance of the alleged Hadith is that there's going to be a war between Islam and Hinduism. <coughs> and the Hindus are up. I have to be identified as the people of shirk. This is, the, this is the thinking. This is the analysis being conducted today, all over Pakistan. That when the Quran speaks of the people of shirk, who will show the greatest hatred and hostility and enmity for you, the Quran is talking about the Hindus. So let us do some elementary analysis and today it's only an introductory lecture 45 minutes I have to come back to this subject again and again 
and exert whatever scholarship I have to try to explain and clarify this subject once and for all. And then after that, it's for the scholars to decide whether Imran is speaking nonsense or whether there's some, some sense in him. I come from the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean, where Hindus and Muslims live. And I want to know whether or not I have found this hatred for Islam in the Hindu heart. But this ayah of the Quran it speaks about. In the 1920s, I was born in 1942, so long before I was born, a hurricane came to Trinidad. You know what's a hurricane, like, like a typhoon. And this hurricane blew off the roof of the masjid in a city called Takarigwa. It's an India, American Indian name. And the day of Juma is coming and the Muslims don't have a place to perform Salatul Juma because rain falls not every day. One of the most famous pundits in the island, a pundit is the highest man in the Hindu religion, the pundit. His name was Doon Pandit. And he was also very, very famous as a man of spiritual healing. But Allah had blessed him with this ability to heal, bi'iznillah. So he was very famous for this, spiritual healing. And Dun Pandit was in Jakarikwa. And when he heard of what happened to the masjid, the roof of the masjid, he invited the Muslim community to come and perform the Salatul Jum'ah in the Mandir. Did you hear that? The Hindu Mandir. So the Muslims said, Pandit Ji, how can we perform Salat in your Mandir when you have all these Murtis, these idols? We can't do that, Pandit Ji. So Pandit, <laughs> Dhun Pandit said, no problem, I'll move them all. And he cleared out the Mandir of all the Murtis. And the Muslims came in the Mandir and they performed Salatul Jum'ah for six weeks until they had repaired the roof of the masjid. Is that hatred? That's uh, something to think about. This is not a normal Hindu. This is not an ordinary Pandit. This is the most famous Pandit in the land. He got into trouble with his own people. <laughs> he got into trouble with his own people, but he was powerful enough to say, don't bother, I am in charge, not you. And I want to leave now this individual case to turn to a collective case, which is just yesterday. The British were leaving India. And they were leaving behind a Hindu people and a Muslim people. Prior to British rule over India, the Muslims had ruled over India for hundreds of years. The Hindus never invited them. And the Hindus were not at all happy with Muslim rule over India. Up to this day, they're not happy. It still pains them very much. Muslim rule over India was not. A rule was established on the basis of the guidance of the Quran. But in fact, it was in conflict with the Quran. Muslim rule over India was in fragrant conflict with the Quran. When the, Muslims, when the British were leaving India, there was consternation in Muslim ranks. What are we to do? And the Muslims decided to establish a movement called the Khilafat movement. 
and the all of India, the whole Muslim community of India stood solidly behind the Khilafat movement. Never before in the history of Islam in India have you ever had a movement like this that captured all the people. The Khilafat movement. And the Khilafat movement, while it was focused upon the preservation of the Khilafah in Istanbul, was primarily directed towards getting the British out of India. That's the primary purpose. The Khilafat movement listened carefully to my words. And if afterwards you were annoyed with me, never mind, we'll be friends later. The Khilafat movement was led by men who knew Islam and who lived Islam. Pakistan has never been led from day one to this day by men who know Islam and who live Islam. The All India Muslim League was never led by men who knew Islam and lived Islam. But the Khilafat movement was led by these men. What about the Hindus? Jawaharlal Nehru was not the leader. The secularized Indian Hindu nationalists were not the leaders of the, Hindi, of the Hindus. The leaders of the Hindu was a British trained lawyer, but he was a Hindu by heart. He was primarily a Hindu. His primary loyalty was to his faith. And he wanted the British out. And he wanted that when we get the British out, we Hindus will live in accordance with Hinduism, not with secularism. And they Muslims want the same thing, that when we get the, Muslim, the, Christian, the, the British out, we Muslims will live in accordance with Islam. So Gandhi scratched his head and he said, but it seems as though we both want the same thing. So he reached out to the Khilafat movement. And I have to tell the Pakistani today what he doesn't know because he's forgotten it. His smartphone is making him foolish. Gandhi reached out to the Khilafat movement. It's not the Khilafat movement reached out to Gandhi. And this is a Hindu and this is the leader of the Hindus. Is this hatred? Is this hostility? Is this enmity? He reached out to the Khilafat movement. He said, let's make an alliance. You and I, we both want the same thing. The Khilafat movement was overjoyed. Maulana Abdul Bari was the leader. Yes, we want it. Gandhi said, I asked for only one thing. That you do not kill the cow in this country. The Khilafat movement said, deal, we will not kill the cow. The law of Islam permits us to eat beef, but out of respect for the people amongst whom we live, because you worship the cow, yeah, you consider it to be a sacred animal, we will voluntarily not kill the cow. Very wise and sensible leadership on the part of the Khilafat movement and Mulan Abdul Bari in particular. And so an alliance came into being. A Hindu-Muslim alliance against the British. And in the whole history of Western civilization, there had never been a more powerful resistance to Western rule than the alliance of Muslims and Christians in India. This does not appear to me to be a people filled with hatred and enmity and hostility for Islam at the time when the Jews are doing that. No. And if the rug had not been pulled out of the feet of the Khilafat movement when they got Mustafa Kemal to abolish the Khilafat. And uh, I know you're going to be annoyed with me, but I have to say what I have to say. The Dr. Mohik, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal also played a critical role in the collapse of the Khilafat movement. And as a consequence of the collapse of the Khilafat movement, the All India Muslim League was able to take over. 
And today you have a secular state of Pakistan, not what Muslims wanted. When the Muslims established the Khilafat movement, they wanted that Muslims, after the bish, the leaving, after the bish had left, we should be able to live in accordance with Islam. And today you have a, I know you're going to be annoyed with me, an Islamic Republic of Pakistan, which should better be renamed as the Islamic Republic of Shushine Boys of Muhammad bin Salman. Yes. An Islamic Republic who, despite the fact that we sent a message to them, we explained to them the Quran, we explained to them what Nabi Muhammad has said, and they don't care, two peanuts, they're still going to the IMF for a loan. Is this the Pakistan that's going to wage war on India in Ghazwatul Hind? And Allah will come to help you to conquer the whole of India? This Pakistan that Allah speaks of and He says, I'm waging war on you? This is the Quran. This Pakistan who lay, who lay out a red carpet for Muhammad bin Salman, for Saudi Arabia, that is lusting for war with Iran. Yes, lusting for war with Iran, knowing that the day that war begins between Saudi Arabia and Iran is going to have civil war in the world of Islam. Hindu, uh, sorry, Sunni and, and Shia fighting each other. And who will laugh? The state of Israel will laugh. And once there is civil war between Sunni and Shia in the house of Islam, goodbye to Pakistan. Pakistan will evaporate in smoke. And you still go? and lay out a red carpet for Muhammad bin Salman. Whereas on the other hand, you should be showing more respect for Iran. Yes. What does the Quran tell us about how to deal with the subject of India and the Hindus? The first thing is that And listen carefully, this is the second ayah I'm quoting. Inna Allah la yugayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not intervene to change your condition, to help you, no matter how desperate your situation may be. And surely, yes, there's war coming between India and Pakistan, we know that. Because that's what Israel wants. And they have the government in India that they want now. They have a war-mongering government in India now. Hmm? Allah will not intervene to change your condition, regardless of how, how terrible it may, it may be, become, until you first make the effort to change your own condition using His guidance. That's the, that is what the Quran says. So what should we do if we are to take the effort to try to change our condition? Well, then I have come to you today. I have 15 more minutes. That's all left. To say there's a parallel between Muslim rule over India for I don't know how many centuries and Muslim rule over the Orthodox Christian world for so many centuries. The Mughal Empire and the Ottoman Empire are sisters. Are sisters. When Islam comes to a people, it comes to liberate them from oppression. And once Islam has come, the people respond with joy and affection, opening their hearts and opening their homes for Islam. And welcoming Islam. And eventually Islam stays in that territory. But when Islam went to the Balkans, to the Orthodox Christian world, how did it go? It went as an invader, waging unjust jihad, wars of naked aggression. And those wars of naked aggression waged by the Ottomans left and enduring an endless legacy of hatred and bitterness and hostility for Islam. That's what they left. 
This was not jihad. This was like that nonsense in Syria. It was a bogus jihad that the Ottomans waged. And as a result of Ottoman bogus jihad on the Orthodox Christians, the same people that Allah has spoken of in the Quran, who will eventually become closest in love and affection for you, not monkey tongue, it's the Orthodox Christians. These people were filled with even more hatred for Islam than in the West. That was the world I found when I launched into the field about 10 years ago. And I went to the Orthodox Christian world. I went to Moscow. I went to Belgrade twice. And I said to them that what the Ottomans did was in conflict with the Quran. They waged war on Constantinople in 1452 in violation of Allah's command in the Quran. If nobody ever said it before, I am saying it now. And if I don't have any support, I'm only one solitary voice and all the world is opposed to me. I don't care two peanuts for them. I must preach Islam to be faithful to the truth whether the people like it or they don't. That's Islamic scholarship. I said, Allah says in the Quran, if your enemy does not want to fight, he's inclined to peace, he wants peace. You are prohibited from fighting. That is in the Quran. The, author, the Orthodox Christian patriarch did not want war. He offered to pay a tribute. But the Ottomans pushed that aside and they waged war. 200,000 Ottoman troops against 9,000 Orthodox Christians. And these Christians fought heroically until they were defeated. And then I said to them something else. When Sultan Muhammad Fatih entered into, Jerusalem, into Constantinople, the first thing that he did was to take the Quran and put it aside. The Quran says that you Muslims must fight to protect the Christian church and the cathedral and the synagogue. You have to fight to protect the cathedral and synagogue. And instead of doing that, you went and you converted the greatest cathedral, Hagia Sophia, to a masjid. Shamefully, disgracefully, manifestly, sinfully. And when I spoke these words to the Christians, they were crying. We didn't know that this was Islam. And now that Orthodox Christian world is drawing closer to us. Alhamdulillah for that. Of course, I made many, many enemies in the process. Those who, who constantly praised that army in 1452, which conquered Constantinople, and who constantly praised that commander, the Sultan Muhammad Fatih, who conquered the city. And then I explained to them, do you know why he said, You know why he said that, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam? That after the great war which is around the corner, the next event will be that you will conquer Constantinople. And he praised the commander and he praised the army. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. He praised this army because you praised that army. He praised this commander because you praised that commander. That's why. And when we conquer Constantinople, we will return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world, which today is led by Russia. And when we return Hagia Sophia, that will cement the reconciliation, friendship and alliance between those who follow Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu while the others of 
worshipping Washington uh, and Santa Claus, both of them. And those who follow Nabi Isa Islam. What did the Mughals do? Well, there is a Babri, you know. A Babri. Babri Masjid, which is exactly, exactly the counterpart to Hagia Sophia. We don't want to know whether there's any proof that Ram was born there. All that we need to know that in the Hindu consciousness, that's where he was born. That's all we need to know. So then why did the Mughal choose this part? <laughs> Answer? Because the Mughals were doing exactly what the Ottomans did, trying to sabotage us. Sabotage us. So we'll, be end, we'll end up in this mess in which we are today. The first step on the road that comes from the Quran, if we are to change our condition, is not... It's not... to beat the drums of Ghazwatul Hind. That's the road to destruction. The first step on the road, if you are to follow the guidance of the Quran, is to recognize that Muslim rule over India was like Ottoman rule over the Orthodox Christians. It was unjust war. Bogus jihad. That's the first step of the road. I don't know any government of Pakistan which could do that. None. I don't know any armed force in Pakistan which could do that. None. It is the scholars of Islam who must show backbone and courage and intellectual insight. And we have to recognize that Muslim rule over Hindu India was unjust. We have to apologize to the Hindus for that. And in the process of doing that, we have to also say about Babri. If you consider this to be the birthplace of Ram, we have no right to be here. We don't want you to give us another piece of land in place for this. No. In the same way that Maulana Bari said to Gandhi, we're not going to kill the cow anymore. That's what he did. That's what the Khilafat movement did. In the same way we say now to Hindu India, we will voluntarily vacate Babri. We have no claims on this territory. Once you affirm that this is where Ram was born. And we'll find another place to build our masjid. If you do this, and if you recognize Muslim rule over India to have been unjust, and you apologize for it, those who have hatred in their hearts for Islam, and who establish their wicked alliance with Israel, and are preparing for war on Pakistan, they would be in consternation. They wouldn't know what to do. Because you're now appealing to the hearts of all the Hindus who are like Pandit, Doon Pandit, who don't have that corrupted heart. I'll tell you another story in the five minutes that I have, because this is my lecture for today. This is the strategy, not Gazwatul Hind. I was 21 years of age. My father was dead, I was an orphan. And my mother was struggling to pay the bills and so on. I was teaching, getting a small salary. And I got a scholarship to go to Al-Azhar. And I went to Al-Azhar. And I was disappointed. Because I didn't, kind, I didn't find the kind of scholarship that I got from Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari when he visited Trinidad. I was 18. So Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari in Pakistan heard about it and he invited me to come to Pakistan. So they arranged my ticket and I flew to Pakistan. But my father had a Hindu friend who had converted to Christianity just to get a job, but in his heart he's Hindu. His name was Lakshman. And when my father was dying, he handed over his family to his friend Lakshman. So you could have a Hindu who had such righteousness, such character, such honesty, that you could hand over your family to him. So Lakshman became a second father to me. And uh, my family want, wanted me to leave Pakistan and go and study law in, in England. And I was also inclined to do that. 
the institute in Pakistan had not been established. I was going to be the first student and so on. And Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari reached to Trinidad at that time. And Lakshman had to meet with him. And the decision had to be taken. Whether Imran will remain in Pakistan and study Islam or whether Imran will go to England and study law. <laughs> when, when Maulana Fadl Rahman Ansari convinced that Hindu man, he then gave permission. He said, no, Imran will remain in Pakistan and study Islam. As a result of which, I'm here today. Is this hatred? Is this enmity? Is this hostility? That your scholar who is sitting here today is sitting here to me because a Hindu gave permission for me to study. I have to end now. It's time for the Azan. But I've ended this lecture on this note. That this Ghazwatul Hind Hadith is going to add salt to the wound and make the Hindus hate you even more than they already hate you. Whereas if you turn the other way and you recognize Muslim rule over India to have been Islamic imperialism and denounce it and apologize to the Hindus as we have apologized to the Christian, Orthodox Christian. And if you say about Babri, we don't need any proof. Once you say that this is where Ram was born, we are vacating and we find another place. My view is this would be a very intelligent and sensible way. And if we act this way, then Allah says, if you are even in a terrible position, he's not going to intervene to help you until you make the effort to change your own condition. If we do this, we will be eligible for Allah's help. Barakallahu lana wa tukum. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta sumiguna. Wa tub alayna ya mulana inna kanta tawabra. Bi rahmatika ya 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 r